welcome back to JavaScript Jabber. This week on our panel, we have Steve Edwards. Hello from a cold and snowy Portland. AJ O'Neill. Yo, 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 coming at you live from a nice cold one. Dan Shapir. Hi from a warm and sunny Tel Aviv where the weather is great and the politicians are terrible. Oh, wow. I'm Char- I don't know how to follow that. I'm Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs. Uh, also cold and snowy here. Uh, we have a special guest this week. That's Ian Schwartz. Ian, do you want to introduce yourself? Remind people who you are. It's been a while. Hi, guys. Uh, Ian Schwartz. I'm a uh, principal JavaScript engineer at CarGurus, and I live in unseasonably warm right now, uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah. Warm sounds so nice. I mean, you know, 45 degrees, which is <laughs> a beach day right. at this time of year. Yeah. Yeah, just just so you know, it's evening here and it's sixty three. Yeah. All right, I'm going to stop talking to Dan now. Um, <laughs> but Ian, you gave a talk a couple of weeks ago at Developer Week. You were talking about uh, domain modeling and functional programming. It had a really long title, and I don't remember all the words. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, effectively, yeah, you were talking about how to put your domain logic into. Uh, I guess, uh, functional, enclosed. I'm probably going to mess up the way that you talked about it. Um, Ways of dealing with that domain uh, knowledge. And what's interesting is, yeah, um, I think you were focused on React, but I'm finding that in a lot of the stuff that I'm building, you can kind of make, you can kind of make use of some kind of strategy like that, no matter what you're in, right? Because your framework logic can call into those things and you can keep them all mostly self-contained. There are always exceptions, but did did I mess it up enough or do you want to add something to that? No, I think, well, hopefully we have something to add to it. We have another (laughs) hour of show to go, but uh, yeah, I I think that was great. Um, Yeah. So I mainly have worked in React since uh, I guess 2000 and uh, I want to say 2017, 2018. Um, And, you know, I, I'm not, I guess I'm not sort of what I think of as the typical functional programming, you know, person in that I didn't come, you know, a lot of people who got into React were functional programming, people who were excited that React was like a way they could express their logic functionally, whereas I sort of came to functional programming, um, you know, through React. Um, And yeah, I guess what I kind of realized at a certain point was that, you know, the more of a vocabulary you have for describing your data functionally, uh, the easier React sort of becomes to work with. Um, you know, even in the early days of React, at least for me, when I first got into React, they always said, you know, you want to express as much of your app logic as a pure function as possible. And so, you know, taking something you've defined inline and, you know, writing a function that says get foo and, you know, it's at least a pure function, right? That's a start, but you can take it a lot further. Um, and the more you're able to apply this, the less need for overhead you have like you know you can still use state management libraries but maybe if your state is simple enough to reason about you know you don't need to reach for something like that um and so that's that's something that i in my role as an educator and as a you know i train a lot of people and work with more junior developers that haven't worked with react and uh it's something that i found really pays off in turn you know exponentially as you're as you're learning the framework and yeah i agree with you it applies Vue, uh solid any of them can benefit um, from some some portion of this, um, it definitely applies to essentially any framework. On the one hand, on the other hand, it's also def- true. I th- I think that React kind of encourages this approach because of the let's call it functional foundations of React itself. The fact that React wants to construct or, or kind of promotes a model of UI construction. Which is which revolves around the composition of functions. Or right. functions are components. You compose components, therefore you compose functions. And ideally, functions are as pure as possible, with props or state coming in and UI coming out. Right. So, so well, I guess actually, this kind of so, approach works yeah. well both ways. To build on that, I actually think that we lost something a little bit when we lost the the class based component syntax. In that, oh yeah, you know, interesting. Well, what, what we lost was that in the in when I first learned React, we had class components that were stateful and effectful, right? And then you had pure functional components that were very easy to write but couldn't do much. And having those two syntaxes 
and having the pure functional version be so much easier to write than the class-based version kind of steered at least the code I was writing towards being mostly pure functional components. Um, the ability to just make any component stateful or effectful is great when you need it. But, you know, all of a sudden now we don't have this clear vocabulary for saying, well, here's one kind of component for situations, you know, that if we can, if we can write it without any state or side effects, we can test every single possible outcome of it. Right. And no, it's going to always be 100%, no mocking needed, no, you know, um, complicated setups. And, and, you know, the, the more those components you write, the easier it is to get this, this widespread coverage of test coverage of at least, you know, some small, por some portion of your app, right? Um, when everything is stateful and everything is effectful, uh, it can be much more difficult to have that level of certainty about your code. Um, uh, for sure. Although it, it is worth pointing out that at least one of the main motivations that React moved from using class-based components for stateful components to using hooks instead is the fact that you can so easily move between stateful and stateless components. You want to make your stateless component stateful, just add use state. You want to make it stateless again, just remove the use state. So, so right. in that, no, way, I, I don't that love was the like one of the main motivations. Yeah, I don't love the class components, but again, I just think that you know, mentally, you know, when you're working with people that, okay, so anybody who has worked with somebody who has been really into functional programming has seen a section of the code base that nobody can read and, and nobody <laughs> knows what to do with, right? And, you know, you can go I mean, down, not me. <clears throat> yeah. I've never seen that. Right, exactly. <clears throat> so you can go down that road, um, you know, I think the most important thing, right, is to make sure that, you know, I work, I work at enterprise companies, other, other people are reading my code besides me. Um, I'm reading other people's code. So the most important thing is, is that code uh, accessible, right? It can't just be that we want to have it be functional, but it has to be accessible and usable. And so I, I think it's great to be able to make a component, you know, stateful just with dropping in a line of code, but at the same time, you know, the, the, the need for those two kinds of components. I don't know, to me, having the easier one be, you know, it, it sort of forces you into to doing it, um, into doing it that way. Sorry, I I'm totally kind of agree. I mean, yeah, for sure. I mean, if nothing else, the minute you put a use state or use effect mm -hmm. into, a fun, into a component in React, you made it exponentially more difficult to test, for right. example. Right. Um, so yeah, for sure. Now, then the key though, right? So if we're talking about writing code that's functional, that that people who are not experts in functional code are able to use, right? Then the key in my mind, at least, is to model that code on, you know, really the, the only two data types that people use in JavaScript, which are arrays and, and promises, okay? Um, the reason we throw, mo a lot of React developers, you know, if you can throw state into an array, all of a sudden it becomes very easy to reason about because when you need to transform that state into something, you have map on the, on the array, you have reduce on the array, you have filter working with that data in a functional way is very intuitive and very easy for, you know, anybody who's learned ES six flavored JavaScript. And so what I um, have started advocating for is, is, you know, modeling your data in a way that matches that where I'll actually model any any data that's going to be used in my app will have a map method on it, for example, um, so that, you know, and defining that custom map method to allow me to to write, you know, uh, data transformations just as easily as I would if that array, if that was an array. Um, Remind me, what's the official uh, functional term for something that has, that is mappable in this way? Well, okay, so... Technically, so there's there's sort of two terms I'll introduce. Okay, the first one is called functor. Functor is anything that has a map method, basically. Um, and the second one, which is sort of a dirty word, is monad. Um, <laughs> and you know, it's very they're simple. They're both dirty words, in my opinion. You know, they're they're not though. If you if you they're they're only hard to explain because most of the explanations that people have of them come from a category theory background which is very hard to understand. But if you use promises in JavaScript and you use uh, arrays, then you understand how monads work um, already, basically. So a monad, okay, 
is essentially a, a data structure. It's not necessarily a container, but you can think of it as as having some sort of inner thing that it's holding. Okay, in the so case of an array, like an array is a container, and like an object is a container, or a, a well, part not not that. literally a container, but you know, an array. We when we when we think about an array, we know that an array has within it, you know, a sequentially numbered list of things, right? That's what it represents. We also know um, that a function has a scope inside of it, so it's a container of a sort. Sure, sure. Does that, okay. does that, does that fit in with this broad definition? Yeah, that's yeah, monads are functions, for sure, absolutely. Monads have functions, and that's exactly right. The, Wait, are the functions they, or have functions? They are functions. They are functions and they have functions. And they have functions. Yeah, okay. welcome to functional programming, AJ. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I feel welcome yet. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, promises are right when you when you create a promise. A promise is is a function, um, and and yeah. Anyway, so the point is, it's a data type, okay, that has at its core a something that it's it's holding within it, rep conceptually, not necessarily literally. In the case of an array, it's a sequential list of things. In the case of a promise, it's an asynchronous task that is either in a completed or yet to be completed or errored state of some kind. Okay. And rather than examining, you know, with with an array, you can directly use indexes to to just grab things from that array. But uh, you know, in a pure functional language, you probably wouldn't do that very much. Instead, you would prefer to, to use, you know, the, the the map reduce for each methods. Those 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 methods that take those callback functions like map, right? Those are the things that put us in the category of functional programming. And um, map is what makes a functor. If you can take something and supply a map method that has uh, a callback that exposes the inner value, and then you know you return it. Uh, and you get another instance of the thing, just like you get a new array back when you map over, you know, an array, right? That that's a functor. What makes it a monad is that it it's flattened automatically. With arrays, you have uh, you know, map, and you also have flat map that automatically flattens it. Flat map is the method that makes an array in JavaScript a monad. In promises, there's no concept of a promise of a promise, so the dot then method automatically flattens it. Right. If you return a promise in a dot then method, you don't get a promise of a promise of a promise. You can only have. You understand what I'm saying? Just um, to uh, just to make a, a quick comment here, in yeah. case our listeners are not familiar with it, flat map is a method on arrays, kind of like map, with the added functionality that if you've got an array of arrays, it flattens it into an array. Right. Uh, so it it uh, think about like an array which where every element in that array is an array, and you know you want to let's say just have all the 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 values all like flattened into just one longer array. That that is something that flat map can do. So right. two things on that. One, it would be better named concat map. Right, because that's what it's doing. Okay. You're you're taking each thing and whatever you return, you're concatenating to the result. Is that? Um, I mean, I think they probably called it flat map because it's basically like calling dot map and then dot flat. Or is it recursive? Is it one layer or is it, it recursive? can be? It can be recursive, but you know, so it could be one level. It can be recursive. Yeah, it it can be recursive. Let but me it's not quickly recursive. pull up the MDN. It's and, actually it's literally so, so called you, flat map in MD in in you know in the yeah. JavaScript right. in the JavaScript language. And yeah, promises just, work the same way. If you return a promise inside of a dot then of a promise, you know, you don't get a promise of a promise, right? It's automatically flattened. So those are the same method. Well um so you you don't get a promise that promises another promise. You oh, get uh, but, a by the way, just a, just as a comment. Just yeah. to clear, uh, just one thing. Uh, I just quickly scanned the uh, jo the MDN. You know the, that excellent JavaScript documentation there. And in the MDN, it just go. It just shows that flat map in JavaScript is just goes one level deep. So it's okay. It's so it's not it's not recursive. Yep. So the, the, to to finish the thought. So with yeah. with the Monad version, does it require it to be recursive? And could it handle an array that 
there's one element's not nested, another element has a nested array, another element has a nested array that has a nested array. So do the layers have to be at the same level or can they be at different levels? And does it have to be recursive? Uh, I'm going to say it doesn't have to be recursive like that, but um, I'm not sure. I've got a little twisted up here. So no, I don't think, I don't think that it has to, you're saying, does it have to fully flatten it every time or can you still have some sort of nested arrays? For, I, yeah, I believe that you can. Yeah. I'm just trying um, to understand the nature of, you know, you're saying right. that, that map is not, um, an array with a map is not, no, a map is not a functor, but flat map is a functor. Well, no, no, n neither one is a functor, right? When, when a data type implements that, that method that's called map or in functional programming terms, more often called bind, right? It then becomes like, we would say that that data type is now a functor. I guess is a better way of putting it. So the method array, itself, you know, a dog is a thing that implements woof, woof and eating kibble and walking on a leash, right? It's not. And so anything that, that can do those things, we would now say is a dog, right? And um, maybe that's kind of a broad definition of so, dog. But, so you yeah. just, but just to, to clarify over something that AJ said, so defining yeah. map or, or bind, as you said, is enough to specify you as being a functor and if you specify flat map versus just map that starts pushing you into monad land right exactly and so the dot then method of a promise is also an implementation of that flat map okay so the reason i bring these up is not because um i need anyone to be an expert in monads or but understanding that this is this is a pattern right that the the javascript that the ecmascript language designers incorporated based on functional programming into the language. And most people um, working in React, at least, you know, if you're working at an enterprise, enterprise company like I do, you know, you're fetching data from APIs, you're modeling state often as arrays, you know, it's very easy to, to work with those two data types in that React JS environment. And I assume in other frameworks as well. Um, and so when we're modeling data and we're, we're taking the, the the, the the logic of our app, you know, the state of our app and how to work with it and what methods to define on it, right? Modeling that data in a way that is just as familiar, throwing a dot map method on something and making it so that you can now map over it, at least in my mind, makes it very intuitive to work with because that's, it mirrors the most commonly used data type in the language. Does that make sense? Yes, I just wanted to add or to make one observation from my perspective. Yes. It, I totally agree that working with maps or with arrays, sorry, or literally anything that has a map method on it, because that's one of the great yeah. things about JavaScript, you know, duck typing. You can throw the, the method over every, anything and it'll work. Um, that comes really naturally when you're working with, in React, because, you yeah. know, anybody who's iterated over anything in React and JSX has used map. Um, promises, on the other hand, that's from my from my experience, a bit more challenging working in React because yeah. React likes to be synchronous. Uh, and, you know, it's it's kind of it's starting to change now with server components and whatnot. But but so far, and and that's something else I wanted to bring up from a few minutes back. I you said callback, but I don't think you meant callback. You said the map function i think you said the map function takes a callback which is not true and javascript Why? map cannot take a callback no it does it's it takes no, it a doesn't. function it's no well, it takes an anonymous function which is not a callback how what's the difference so a callback is when something happens asynchronously and you're going to call back after the asynchronous operation is uh, happening. Yeah, yeah, I think a lot a of people map, when when they when when they pass a function into something they call it callback. Which is which is incorrect, but I agree with you and that's why I wanted to bring it up because oh, it's very okay. confusing. Let to us talk for the sake of stuff. moving it forward say I won't call it callback again. I'm striking it from my vocabulary. <laughs> well, no, it's just it's just if you're talking about something that's asynchronous, right? Because we it, JavaScript can be confusing because we've got promises and promises don't work with maps, for example, right? We we don't have any native methods that will do what map does for a promise. And so we it's, do. It's called dot then. That's what it's called. I, I, well, but you have to write a container around that, right? Or you have to put it 
so so yes you can emulate the behavior but we do not have something we do not have a single method that you can call that will do it you can you can chain dot thens together and that gives you the same benefit but it's not intuitively i see this with new new developers all the time and imagine you do too they use dot map thinking that it's a callback thinking that they can put something asynchronous in there and then find out that they've got oh you know, you're, what, you're what talking called. you're talking about the fact that you can't use in a sync function as as the function for iteration well you can technically but the, you get back it doesn't array work of as expected you yeah. Yeah, yeah you'll get back an array of promises that probably that aren't resolved uh yeah um and and you can and yeah it it gets funny that way yeah but these are these are you know the the the, the complexity of mixing these two data types i i think is is sort of a secondary thing to the fact that they they both present a, a language that um you know you don't have to check with a promise whether or not it's been resolved right you can write your promise code and your dot thens and all that's kind of extracted away from you and the same with an array you know one of the reasons that dot, that for each is so much better than than writing like a uh, you know than direct access right is is that well, it works just as well if it's access. empty. Well, I mean then like you know a map bracket, and filter bracket access is what oh, I'm talking okay. about, right? Th that that iterating using those functional methods works so well is that it works just as well whether the array has anything in it or not, right? You don't have to to make those checks in your code if the array has any members to it, then do something to it. So one of the things that I've done is I've worked on this um, this uh, Node.js module uh, that I call uh, State S C H T A T E, which is a weird name, but I uh, I name all my projects S C H, just how I do it. Um, and basically, this came from the idea: well, if I wanted to write a data type that does that same thing, right? I, I wanna I wanna not I wanna not have to check. Uh, in the same way, I don't have to check with a promise whether it's been resolved or not. I can just write my dot thens and it's taken care. What if I could abstract away if else statements from my code, right? And model my data in a way where, you know, it's in this box and I can just write methods that work against it, just like the dot then methods work and not have to check um, things. So in the now, case of, yeah. Is that, is that the maybe monad? Because I've heard this talked about before, and this is interesting. You you, and right. you can compose. Have you heard about call bags? Call bags? Call bags. Yeah. No. Okay, then I won't I won't go into it, but it it's kind of in this vein, event-oriented yeah. functional. Yeah, so I, saw, I saw that talk that you gave, but yeah, but let's not go there. Yeah. Now. So the, the maybe monad is exactly when I started writing the library, that was the first one I wrote. Um, and the maybe monad, you know, I, I had played with Rust a little bit in the past and Rust has, uh, they call it an option type, um, which is essentially also a maybe monad. And uh, that's exactly right. The idea behind this was that, you know, in React, it's a tree-like structure, right? You you make your 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 you fetch your data somewhere near the top of the page, or it comes preloaded from server components or or whatever other method, and it's passed down the tree. And you know, in practice, we end up writing throughout the body of a JS of a React app a lot of little if checks. You know, if it's there, then do the thing to it, and if it's not there, then give me this other thing. And I, the earlier in the tree you make that decision, uh, the better, right? So if I could wrap my data in a maybe monad. And then pass it down the tree. Then I can, you know, uh, extract things from it and write transformations against it without ever having to to write an if statement. Was was kind of the goal of it. Um, and you know, one of the th benefits of this approach in React, but uh, is the fact that because of JSX, we end up doing a lot of things as expressions. You yeah. know, one of the problems in in JavaScript is that statement, when you try to use JavaScript as a functional programming language, is that in JavaScript, uh, instructions or statements are not expressions. You can't really use, let's say, an if as in, in, in an expression. You have to use, uh, uh, um, how is it, how is it called? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the question mark. Um, Oh, the nullable. Uh, no, the uh, the, tr the, trainer, the ternary operator. Ternary operator. Oh, operator. Yeah. yeah, and and you end up with really complicated and hard to read uh, stuff in your in your um, 
uh, JSX because of that. Because again, you right. need to do you handle all of JSX as as you know this one big expression. So anything that you can do as part of an expression, and that's one of the benefits of functional programming that everything becomes an expression really lends, its, lends itself to this kind of an approach. But I yeah. think it might be beneficial to expand a little bit about what, uh, what uh, maybe uh, actually is. Sure. So maybe essentially at its core, right? In the same way that, you know, we said a promise is conceptually holds, you know, some effect that has or hasn't finished firing, right? Maybe holds a thing that might be there or might not be there. Um, and you know, non-existence is a problem in JavaScript because, you know, we already have two types for defining non-existence. Things can be undefined. They can be null. Um, but you know, with a, maybe you basically, uh, you wrap the, some value or the output of a function and, uh, you can write, it has a dot map method. So you can write, uh, not a callback, but uh, a function supplied to that dot map method that will operate on the data only in the event that it's present. And if the maybe has nothing in it, then uh, it will be ignored in the same way that writing a dot map against an empty array is also essentially. Um, so it's like, it's to make things simpler, simple, it's like uh, an array with a single element versus an array with zero elements. So having the value right. means that you're like That's an array with a single element and having no value means that you're like an array with zero elements. Right. And, and being able to write methods that call that can either map over it if it's something or, you know, can fire if there's nothing there. I have methods for that as well. You know, mirrors the, the way we can write dot then and dot catch with promises, for example, where, you know, we know that the promise is just going to call which side of the code it has to call. Um, at the time that it needs to be called. So this allows you to, to not make a decision about what to do with this data, whether it's there or not, as you pass it down the tree. And then eventually you get to a point where you do have to make that decision. Eventually you get to a point where the, you, know, you need to either return one piece of UI if, if something is there and something else if there's nothing there, right? Um, and when you, so in, functional programming languages, they would do this using a feature called pattern matching, which doesn't exist in JavaScript. Um, if you look at like Rust, you know, you basically write code that says, if the case is something, return this, if the case is nothing, return this. Um, and so I've written a method that, you know, I wrote a method that kind of hacks at pattern matching using um, JavaScript syntax and, and lets you, from that point, you're no longer in maybe land, right? When you need to know, okay, well, if there is a user, I want to show this. And if there isn't a user, I want to show the login page, right? That's where you're making that decision. Um, so uh, after writing the maybe, I sort of realized that there were other data types that I could apply this to. Um, and so I wrote a few other types in the library. Uh, the first thing I wrote was a, a type called state, which is a simpler version uh, of the maybe in that it doesn't, it, it just holds a thing, right? It doesn't hold a thing that could be not there, just has a thing in it, offers a dot map and some other easy methods for working with the data in that thing. Uh, and then I wrote uh, either, which is another one that comes from Rust. Um, either is a data container that has a left side and a right side. So this is either a string on the left or a number on the right. Um, and the either type offers dot left and dot right methods for mapping over either side. Uh, and then I went and I rewrote maybe because I realized that maybe is essentially an either of something or nothing. Um, so I rewrote it to use either under the hood. Um, and, you know, it, it's one of these things that as you're talking about, as I'm talking about it, I know it sounds complex, but, um, you know, the idea is that a lot of the, the confusing parts about modeling code uh, modeling data are are abstracted away. So there is some complexity, but it's not complex to use, right? My phone is a complex machine, but ideally, you know, it shouldn't be hard for me to interact with it. Um, and so, you know, when, when writing, when modeling data on an app, especially it's going to be used by a lot of other developers, especially more junior developers, the most important thing is them being able to take that data and log it to the console or debug it and poke at it and have well-defined methods for working with it and have it be straightforward. So um, a lot of care and thought has gone into the design of the API, I guess. Is uh, 
and like I said before, I think that using these uh, functional constructs in the context of React is is really powerful because the fact that, like I said, with JSX, you want to have as much as possible of, as of the logic as part of the JSX expression itself and not in various ifs and whatnots that you use to construct like par portions of JSX and then kind of put them together and, and then you really end up in a mess. Um, right. So, so and, and you know, sorry, yeah, please. No, and, and being also able to pass these functional constructs as params from a parent component into its child components is also as part of the props is also doable and really powerful. Now the other the other side of it too, and the thing that I I emphasize a lot when I talk to people is um, when I talk about this is testing because um, you know I really believe in having well tested user interfaces, um, and you know I have in my mind sort of a hierarchy of how hard, where in the code things can be versus how hard they are to test. Like an if statement or a, a ternary inside of the JSX and a return statement of a component is really annoying to test, right? And it's slightly less annoying if that logic is defined in the body of the component and slightly less hard to test if it's defined in a hook. But if you can define it as a pure function in some way, then it becomes very easy to test um, because pure functions can be called you know, I, I love React Testing Library, but, you know, setting up a component with React Testing Library often involves boilerplate. If you can test a piece of functionality without having to have that boilerplate, um, you know, the tests will run faster and be less, less you know, difficult to read and write. Um, so that's a big part of why I really push for this. And by boilerplate, I guess you mean things that set up mocks and stuff like that. Yeah, or even just, you know... Um, yeah, things that set up mocks, you know, sometimes even, you know, if you're if you're modeling your data in a functional way, right, creating an instance of that function to pass as a prop in the render function of React testing library is not that hard. But, you know, sometimes you're you're passing things that are deeply nested JavaScript objects. And, you know, maybe maybe there's five lines of code, ten lines of code at the top of the test file just creating the props to pass down. Um, you know, uh yeah, and, and often it involves it often involves mocking APIs. Often it involves um, you know having having your 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 router for your tests. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's just there's a difference between testing a whole component to test this line of code versus just being able to test this line of code um, itself in some way. So at the end of the day, when you construct when you implement uh, some functionality in React, what you're saying is that you house all your state in these functional constructs is that is that what you're saying effectively you know in in something resembling them right like the state library is not like i'm not using that in production at work by any means but um you know it's meant to represent kind of the, the way that i think about code and i use it as an educational tool more than anything else right now uh because you can you can implement a dot map method uh on on anything on any data type that you build right it doesn't you don't have to use mine you can you know it's it's a couple lines of code to create dot map and once you know how to do it you know doing it again and again is very easy um but having this mental model in place yeah i always write code you know and it may be overkill for some applications don't get me wrong there's plenty of apps that are not data driven but when you're working with with deeply nested data um you know, there's this one of the, one of the other uh, things that I I teach people about when I do this is a, a concept called lenses, which is another functional programming term, and this is to me is really cool because in object oriented programming, right, you have you know your your model and it has getter and setter methods for for mutating the value of it, right? Um, but lenses are are functional a functional approach to the same thing. So your setter methods will always um, return a new instance of the, the thing that you're working with, right? And so uh, a lot of the data types I build will have dot .map and then dot .map will be used within these functional setter methods um, so that when a 
more junior person or even just somebody who hasn't worked with this piece of the code base before looks at it, they have a very clear place to look to see all the different types of transformations we, we're doing on the data throughout the app, right? Because we're we're specifying them in one place and um, a very clear place to add more logic that goes with that. And, uh, um, you know, you can they can copy and, you know, you can see how it's been tested in the past. Um, it's all about making it easy for that next person to to jump on board. Um, which, you know, I, I admit that talking about it doesn't always sound that easy, but, uh, so uh, here, you know. so here's a question, you know, obviously yeah. JavaScript is not a pure functional language. Yeah. Uh, currently, uh, it doesn't have, let's say, for example, immutable data structures. It might gain sure. some if, and when, uh, the records and tuples proposal becomes officially part of JavaScript or ECMAScript, but currently it doesn't. So effectively, you're simulating uh, an immutable data structure on top of data structures that aren't in, intrinsically or inherently immutable. Um, sure. And that creates a certain amount of overhead, both practical and conceptual. How do you deal yeah. with that? Well, first of all, TypeScript makes it much easier um, because with TypeScript, you know, we can, um, you know, very easily, first of all, you can't really, you're right, we don't have immutable data structures, but with TypeScript, we can, you know, kind of get the TypeScript compiler to tell us that it's immutable. Hmm. Um, and, you know, the other, the other thing, I guess, and the other thing with TypeScript is uh, return types on functions, um, you know, all those, all those setter lens methods, right, should all be returning a new instance of the thing you're working with. And so in the code review process, it should be very easy to see if somebody is accidentally mutating the data by the fact that their method will now be returning void versus returning um, a new instance. Uh, you're right in that, you know, there's like with a monad in Haskell, for example, you can't directly examine the inner value. You can only get at it through using the bind function. And in JavaScript, you're right, you can directly inspect it, but, um, in some cases, that's a plus too, because it means that you know when you're looking at it in your in your in your browser console, um, it's probably more transparent for debugging purposes uh, than it would. You know what I'm saying? Like you still write the code that way, but you do have access to more data than uh, than you probably should. <laughs> uh, which, which which you know With if great it's in a power. read. It's, comes great responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> you know, look, it's the wild west in JavaScript, right? At the end of the day, you can do what you want. Um, TypeScript for me has really been, I, I was, I did not like TypeScript at first. I have come around on it. Um, and in part, it's due to leaning into functional programming because they play so very well together. Um, I think if I can digress a little bit, yeah. I think that's really a key aspect of why TypeScript was really disliked by many, including myself initially, and has now grown on so many of us, including me to a great extent. Yeah. And the reason is that initially when TypeScript came out, it was positioned in, well, given its C-sharp influences, it's not surprising, but it was really positioned as this kind of a uh, statically typed object-oriented layer on top of JavaScript. Uh, you know, classes and interfaces and extends and, and stuff like that. And a lot of us were looking at it and thinking this is like a poor man's Java and we didn't, we didn't like Java, so we're using JavaScript. And now they're just trying to stick Java or C-sharp down our throat using TypeScript. And... I think that TypeScript, due to uh, frameworks or libraries like React and the way that JavaScript developers prefer to use it, has really evolved a lot to be a, to have a more functional approach itself. I'm I'm seeing a lot of people use TypeScript without ever using classes or even interfaces. They're just using types and functions and, you know, generics and stuff like that. And, and that makes yeah. for a really powerful utility in this context that, that you just that, said. That said, that said, I love JavaScript classes. I know I'm in the minority, 
Um, I think they actually play really <laughs> well with functional programming, as long as, as I said, all your setter methods return a new instance. Um, but to me, there's something very intuitive about, uh, and maybe it's because I kind of started with Ruby and then came to JavaScript. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Um, there's something about, you know, the fact that the type of the thing is the same as the, you know, the class name is, is the type, uh, and being able to introspect things that way that for me, at least just makes a lot of sense. Although I don't think every, you know, and you know, they, they aren't really classes. They are just a, a, a JavaScript class is just a function with closures on it. Um, so, and you know, a prototype that's, that's the preference. Sure. But, uh, yeah, that's true. Um, but you can model, you know, you can model the data the same way and create the same API, whether or not you're using classes or, or, you know, regular, uh, function declarations. Um, that's sort of, set, you know, that's, that's, I call that your accent, how you code, how you code in your accent, right? Is it uh, Ruby flavored JavaScript or is it, uh, you know, <laughs> JavaScript flavored I'm JavaScript. guilty yeah. of that. <laughs> I, I'm kind of forced to use classes at work because we have a lot of Angular code and also yeah. some Nest uh, JS base, based services, and both of them are big on classes. So I can't get away with yeah. it, whether I like it or not. Um, but but going back to your point, I mean, yes, please. Uh, your original topic, let's say, not your point. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I assume that even now, a lot of React developers hearing you talk about mm -hmm. immutable uh, uh, data are thinking. Redux. So how is everything you're talking about, how is it different from Redux, especially given that Redux is kind of on the decline? Um, you know, I think what I'm talking about is sort of agnostic to your particular state management solution. Um, you know, what I'm talking about is how, you know, as the data is passed down through the app, I get, well, I guess it depends on how you're using Redux. You're right. If you're, if you're using Redux in a way where, you know, uh, every component in your app has access to it and can, can read and write to the store, um, then, then maybe, maybe this won't work with your style. I, I don't know. I don't really write code that way. I'm kind of allergic to Redux myself. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of like the built-in state management to React. And I think that if you can keep your state simple enough, you don't have to reach for tools like Redux. Um, like I said, Redux is definitely but, on the decline. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, you know, who's to say, you know, what you keep in your Redux store could be an instance of a more feature filled model just as easily as it could be a plain JavaScript object to my knowledge. I don't know why um, you wouldn't be able to apply more techniques to. So basically, if yeah. I'm understanding what you're saying, you're saying Redux is more of a, um, let's call it a holistic view or a, a unified representation of your entire state. Whereas sure. what you're talking about is how to uh, encapsulate specific small parts of the state and represent them in a functional and then use them in a functional way. So regardless right. of how you're containing your state as a whole, when components pass state or data to each other, they do it uh, in a functional manner. A am I understanding right. it correctly? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, even within the context, like when you go to set some state in your Redux store, in your Redux store, you know, at some point you have to describe those changes that you're making to the state, whether it's within your reducer or, you know, wherever else that code lives, you know, you're making a change to that data in some way. Um, and yeah, uh, uh, you know, the the simpler it is to describe that change and the, the more easy it is to 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 look at the various pieces of logic that make up that change, the easier your life is going to be. Um, you know, sometimes when you set data, again, I don't really work with Redux very much. I try to keep it out of my projects, but it, it's not hard to see, you know, uh, deeply nested spreads, you know, an object with a spread and then that another object with a spread and then another object with a spread, you know, I, I want to be able to describe things using methods that, you know, lenses that the, the method name to make sense. And I know just from the method, what product I'm setting, what, what, what property I'm setting. And even if I'm then storing that in Redux or in native React state or, uh, you know, in some other construct is, is almost, you know, that, 
that's almost secondary to me. I'm talking about how you describe your logic. Yeah. So exactly. if I can, if I'm trying to think of a concrete example, let's say I'm, I have yeah. a React application, and within that React application, I have uh, the name of the currently logged in user, which right. might be null if the user is not logged in, which would result in a different in different components rendering their content in a different way based on whether or not a username is available or or is null. Instead of passing a string around and then doing a lot of existence checks all over the place, I would wrap that value as a maybe. As a maybe. And then pass it that way around. And then I just, you know render let's say the stuff that it is dependent on the name either gets rendered right. or not and i don't have to use all these if statements in my code is that uh, the you, gist of it you, that is the gist of it exactly you know if you were just storing it as a string or null and then you write in the component you'd probably write something like you know you'd have your angle brackets in your jsx and you'd write you know uh you know you'd put name in it and if that name was null and you don't handle the null case, then React, I guess, won't show anything, right? Um, but the advantage of using a maybe is that when you go to eventually unwrap the value and get that value out to put it in your React, you're going to have to handle both cases. You can't, um, you know, I, you can't, you don't, you don't want to be in a situation where you could have a null and not have handled the null. And so, in languages that appear functional, like Elm or like um, like Haskell or even with Rust, you know, when you go to unwrap that, you're forced to handle both cases. And so with with my maybes and with most implementations of maybe, uh, it's that way as well. Um, so you can't you can't just ignore the fact that it could be null, which is a big part of the upside of it, if that makes sense. Yes, uh, it does. Although you, you, to be, for better or worse, TypeScript kind of forces you to handle the, this as well. I mean, if you've got a value that's uh, you know, string question mark rather than string, then you kind of uh, need to take care of the undefined uh, scenario. You can't just treat it as a string. Um, if you're going to, yeah, if you're going to do something to it, but if you're going to stick it into your JSX, you, mm. you certainly can. It'll take undefined just as well as anything else. You know, it, it, it UI development, one of the one of the hard things about UI development is accounting for all the different states that are available. And so the more prescriptive you can be, um, I think in the domain modeling, you know, the the less mental, you just like with, with any other tool, with using TypeScript at all, with using linters, with using um, you know, any tool that that takes the power off of your brain and puts it into the code, you know, and that's that's kind of what I'm what I'm advocating. I, for. I'm totally with you that if the type system can force me to account for all the the different scenarios, that's a, a big advantage. I mean, when you know it, TypeScript kind of goes part way, uh, part of the way. You know, yeah. um, f- language that are more functionally strict go a, a longer way I, i'm also using kotlin at work for example and and it's in it's more and it's more strict in this regard and 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 you you're less likely to have these kind of uh null errors where you're you're not properly handling a null or nullish value and like you said in in in, yeah. in react uh, you can, you know, just pass the undefined on as if it was the string value, and you right. and you know, all of us have seen UIs where it says username colon undefined, <laughs> right? Or high comma nothing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, I I don't mean for any of this to be prescriptive or to me, you know, to be, but for me, this is just. Um, a way of thinking about things, you know, that that feels a little bit more like putting the square peg into the square hole. Um, and, you know, within the context of React, you don't have to write code this way, but I think it's harder if, you know, even in, look, even in pure functional language, you can write imperative code in Haskell. It's just, it's a headache to do it. And, uh, you know, that headache exists in React as well. Um, because, because like I said, most of us, you know, you don't, most people don't learn functional programming as a prerequisite to learning React. 
Um, but you know, I, like I just watched the react documentary the other day and every single one of the people they interviewed who was an early adopter said, Oh, react at last a way to model my UI functionally. So, you know, there's sort of a disconnect because I, I, I don't know, I guess, cause it's began, because it's taken over the world of UI development and we're all scrambling to learn it. Um, that, you know, you have these tools as part of it and, and this, this paradigm that fits so well with it, that most of the people working with it have had, you know, at best a cursory introduction to. So um, when you code in React, do yes. the parameters, so instead of passing simple values around as parameters, your code mostly uses parameters that are effectively either functors or monads and maybes well, or uh yeah functors monads absolutely yeah almost basically any any data so one of the things that helped with developing this is that on my team we have found ourselves in a situation numerous times of developing uis where the back end wasn't ready yet it's just the way it worked organizationally it's you know it's fine but one of the ways that we decided to be robust about that is that Every API call, rather than storing the data directly and passing it down, we turn it into an instance of some sort of functional wrapper. And this way, when the actual API is available, if, if our expectations about how it was going to work are different than we thought they were going to be, which has happened, right? Then the only place that really needs to change is that initial transformation function that wraps it and turns it into this monadic data type. Um, because that's a thing that's feature filled, right? So the, the constructor method might change or the dot create static dot create method might change, but we we were able to build UIs without having to think about how the API data was going to look. Um, and, and that led me to sort of this realization that, you know, the needs of, of the API you decide for communicating your data doesn't usually match what you actually need to render your UI, your UI. turning it into something a little smarter, a little more uh, feature filled, right? And this is, I mean, Ruby, you know, when I, when I was doing Ruby on rails, right. You know, they have this abstraction over the database called active record where you create a model, mm -hmm. right. That describes your database schema, but also, you know, explains how, you know, how to work with that data defines methods for, you know, uh, for, for, for transforming or modeling that data, right. Turns it into something rich and feature filled. You're not just getting your, your, raw you know database output you're getting this this thing that knows how to work with itself and that power in a ruby on rails app is so comfortable to have and i want that same power in javascript land right i want everywhere except for the place where i get the data to have a thing that just knows knows how to work with itself and knows how to describe its own logic and has it all encapsulated and this is you know this is something that comes from object oriented programming right they're not at odds with each other fp and oop they're, they're two sides of the same coin. And really the only downside about an OOP is mutability. Um, but the encapsulation and the, the intelligence of the, of the data types is, is absolutely worth, yeah, I try to do that in as much of my code as I can. So my, the, the question that I have is this. So you said you created yeah. uh, a library, but you're not really using it in production yet. Uh, so what are you using in production? Are you just, you know making sure to add these methods uh, to your uh, objects as, uh, as a best practice, or are you actually using some sort of library that implements it for you or some other tooling that enforces this convention or what are you doing? Uh, the former, we're just doing it as a, as a convention on the team. Um, you know, it's a big company and the teams have a fair amount of autonomy. Um, so we're able to, write the code in a way that makes sense for us. Um, and so it has been by convention. Um, I do feel somewhat validated in that when people have come on to the project, you know, they tend to uh, get moving very fast and um, people have then asked me for more resource, you know, we th are then interested in more resource about functional programming because they found in debugging something that they knew exactly where to look and exactly where to make the change. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just by convention at the moment, you know, I, I, I would love to use shot at work, uh, but I, 
I don't really think it's there yet. There's a couple of features that I would need to um, hammer out before I would put it on something I was being paid to work on. I've used it on a bunch of, you know, little personal projects and experimented with it. And the co the, the test coverage on it is close to a hundred percent. So, um, you know, the tests are also a place where I have, I did a lot of TDD on it and, um, uh, got a chance to really you know, get a feel for the API of it at the time. Uh, but yeah, as I said, it's mostly a learning tool. You know, I, I show it to people with the intention of having them, um, you know, there was an example I saw in somebody else's talk, and I wish I could remember whose it was, um, but they were talking about how array, how functional programmers think. And, you know, you can have an array of things and you can write a for loop to to log each item of the array, right? Or you can write a function that takes an array and then encapsulate the for loop in that. And then a functional programmer says, well, what if I didn't want to log those things? What if I want to pass a function as a second argument, right? And now I have a for each. And, um, you know, I, I just got to thinking that what if we could take, a, you know, the for loop was one, a construct in the language that everybody used. And we figured out how not to use it anymore by wrapping it in functional programming patterns and including it in the language, right? And what if we could do that for other things like, you know, like, non-existence like if something is there or not what if that's a function we could abstract that and once you kind of get that mental model and get the power of it um you know it, it can there's a lot of different ways to apply it to data and there's a lot of inter, you know you can build a lot of monad type interfaces that um you know are specific to your domain it's not doesn't have to be a general thing you apply to everything it's okay to build up a high level language for for describing your logic um, some languages push you to do this automatically. JavaScript doesn't. Uh, but, you know, I want it to be just as easy as working with with any other built-in data types of the language. So, yeah, we try to, we try to keep that in mind at all times. Um, you could uh, introduce ESLint rules, for example, that enforce this, this convention in certain ways. That's true. I could. I, I think that that would be a tougher sell for the team, to be honest. Um, but, you know, if I rule, if there's ever a point where I, I am in a position to do that, I would totally do that. Um, and yeah, how, how would you, I, I've never written a Leoslint rule. How, how hard would you say it is to do something like that? Is it pretty? Uh... To be honest, I've not really done it either. Uh, I mo I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've configured Leoslint, but I've not actually implemented my own rules. Uh, I assume it's not that bad, though. I mean, a lot of people it are is. doing it. <laughs> it is it is it depends it, it depends so it's bad for someone like me right i don't like to have 600 dependencies to do something simple and the it's probably better now than when i did it which was about two years ago at this point but it, it has to because of the nature of the javascript community where actually you know javascript doesn't matter it's just aspirational whatever is in draft, we'll call it JavaScript and we'll call type trip JavaScript and we'll call JSX JavaScript. It, it, at the time it didn't actually support the language of JavaScript. It just supported a bunch of transpilers, some of which were JavaScript, some of which were drafts, some of which have mm -hmm. already been abandoned. And so in order to get all of the piping configured to get the code to be in a state that it could be understood. It, it's like, have you ever looked at a, you know, the difference you've seen source map errors, right? Uh -huh. It was like, it was like that kind of process where you're trying to get a bunch of plugins to load, to run on some text and hope that the text is in the right state by the time your plugin runs so that, I didn't understand it. It was hard. But for most people <laughs> doing simple things is probably is probably easy enough. I was trying to put a rule in place for something about promises or something about uh something about some feature that happened to not be at the time required some sort of plug in and and then in the, you know and then it was just yeah, it was I can't do it. I, I can think only it'd be do hard things. I think it'd be hard to model this as a as a linter rule too. You know, it'd be I'd have to do a lot of thinking about how because there, you're still going to have React components that are going to take a string or a number or an object as a prop, right? Even if you're using this in your code, 
um, it's not going to, not everything is going to be wrapped in something like this. And um, so, you know, it'd be hard to, to do it in a universal way, in my opinion. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not possible. It would just be a very, very, be a very opinionated code base. Um, maybe more opinionated than I want to go for personally. All right. Well, I think we're kind of getting toward that time where we need to do picks and start ratchet, wrapping up. Um, anything else you want to just drop in before we're done? No, I think, uh, I think, uh, I think I made, made some good points. Hopefully, hopefully it wasn't, uh, too boring, Steve. <laughs> so I yeah. still have the question. What is a monad? What <laughs> is a functor? And, and I, what I want to know is if I was looking at 10 lines of code. Yeah. And someone says, ah, you're using monads. And I would say, I agree. People tell me that all the time. Which line of this code is the monad, please? That's that's where no one has been able to answer me that question. And I feel like that's, I A get conceptually, type, yeah. but I, I, what, how do I point and say line seven, column five, the variable named X. Right. This is the the monad. If, or, if it's a if it's a data type that has a method on it that implements what they call the bind method, okay, which as we said is flat map for arrays, it's then for promises. If it if if you can implement that bind method, uh, then it, your data type can be considered to be in the category of monad. So um, a promise in JavaScript as it's natively implemented. So if I just do mm -hmm. async function return the string hello. Sure. And I run and I call this function greet. So okay. if I call the function greet and I do let greeting equals greet invoked the variable greeting is a monad. No, the the greet function I think would be the monad, I think. The greet function. Like your, your fu the function that is being assigned to that variable. Yeah, the function is the monad. So the, the async, so every async function is a monad because it returns an object that that implements the dot then. Yeah. The interface that will have a dot then. And dot then itself is not what a monad is, but the concept of binding is what makes a right. an a a container, an object, a thing that has a function that can do a binding. Yeah. And the binding must accept a function, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. Correct. The that binding exposes must the accept... inner value of that data type in some way and lets you operate on it. And then returning a new instance of the thing. Okay, so... Right, dot okay. then, you're always going to get a promise out of a dot then. You're never going to get anything but a promise out of a dot then. Okay, so you, you have a type guarantee that it's of the same type, so you're not transforming the type. But right. with a map, you often are transforming the type. So is... is Well, you're always getting an array, though. I mean, you're right. You're getting a different array of a different thing. Okay, so the, the container type is the same type, or yeah. at least the same interface. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same strict type, but it has to expose the same interface. Brace yourself for angry emails from functional programming nerds to right. say, say how wrong I, I am. <laughs> we I know well, you want to we, get prints, we yeah. are definitely at time. What I propose is that we come back and we just dive into what functional programming is and what a lot of these ideas are. It'd yeah, be sure. fun to get into some of the combinators and you know some of the other things that go into this that people use to explain and explore functional programming because it gets rather abstract and then breaking it down into, cause I don't know if I could explain it to AJ you know, hard, any better than you're doing. Right. It. And I'm not sure I understand it completely either. Explaining it, using it is yeah. easier than explaining it. And I know you want to get onto picks. Can I give my pick because it'll actually help with this too. Yeah, do it. All right. So there's a, a podcast that they're no longer making episodes of called the Lambda cast. There's like 23 episodes of it. I think and I've heard of that one. It's like, for me, it's like required reading for functional programming because it's a panel style show 
The host is, I think, a Haskell developer, if I remember correctly, or F Sharp, one of the two. But he's basically explaining and talking about functional programming concepts with a few other people, none of whom are functional programming people, and all of whom have different language backgrounds. So it's language agnostic, and there's 23 episodes. And if you listen to all 23, AJ, by the end, you will know what a monad is. The, oh, uh, cool. actually, just uh, <laughs> Sam's 24 hour guide to monads. Well, Put it on 1.75x and you'll be good if, to go. If you're looking, if you're looking there for you go. Now it's a 12 hours to knowing monads. If you're looking for an interesting uh, alternative, there's also on Eged.io, they have uh, Professor Frisbee introduces composable function, functional JavaScript, which I recall is, is pretty out there, uh, pretty amusing and highly instructive. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to push this into picks. Uh, actually, self-promo. Is it? You just raise your hand if you want to just put something out there you're working on that people should know about. We'll do it this way. Um, all I'll say, I, I'll raise my hand and just say that after a very long hiatus, I contributed something to open source. Uh, I've, you know, I've been, I've, I've, you know, I've dabbled here and there, but I've never been, unfortunately, a huge uh, open source contributor. But I just had an interesting opportunity. So uh, we're using uh, Prometheus at work. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a, a kind of a mechanism for collecting um, uh, performance-related information and then being able to graph it out using tools like Grafana. And uh, there's a connector for a variety of programming languages and environments. And uh, I looked at the implement the existing JavaScript implementation, which is called, you know, unsurprisingly, Prom Client. And uh, I made it much more efficient. So, and then I gave them that uh, that little bit of code and you know they accepted it so here's my contribution to open source after a long while uh the funny thing is i actually have an additional contribution that i'm thinking of handing to them which is much more complicated it's <laughs> half a rewrite of everything they've done i just wanted to see that they accepted the small one before i tried to foist the huge one on them i'm like like here's Here's a PR. I'm only changing all your code. <laughs> anyway, so that's something I've been doing. All right. Well, I am working on actually launching a few of these uh, premium video series. Uh, one's going to be on careers. I'm putting one together on Ruby and one on Rails. Uh, one's going to be on dev tools. And then I'm working on one related to JavaScript. Um, and there is the off chance that I might actually transition to front end development for a full time gig instead of doing Rails on the back end, Welcome which I've done for side. like sixteen years. And so, if the, if that becomes a thing, then it's probably going to be focused on React since that looks like the direction things are going to go. But uh, anyway, just putting that out there. Um, and uh, yeah, so keep an eye out for that because it might turn into a React series instead of a JavaScript series. Um, all right, let's do picks. Uh, Steve, do you have some picks? Yes, considering how much I contributed to this episode, I actually do have some picks. Uh, Ian, I found this one little quote I was Googling, looking for descriptions of monads, and found a quote that's used by, uh, apparently used by Douglas Crockford. It says, once you understand monads, you immediately become incapable of explaining them to anyone else. Yeah, that's... <laughs> I love Douglas. It's just a mono in the category of endofunctors. What's the big deal? <laughs> uh, and that's my other non-joke pick of the week. Uh, to the high, high point of all, my podcast episode, my dad jokes of the week. Um, you know, some of my favorite jokes have to do with grammar and the importance of them, such as a, the importance of a comma when you say, let's eat grandpa versus let's eat grandpa. Uh, another variety of that one is... Uh, a colon can completely change the meaning of a sentence. For example, Jane ate her friend's sandwich versus Jane ate her friend's colon. Right? A little cannibalistic there. Um, <clears throat> I've often also talked about jobs and how I've got fired from them. Um, in this case, I didn't get fired. It was just an interesting job because it was making plastic Draculas. There were only two of us on the production line, so we had to make every second count. Oh my! Um, 
Right. Steve, do you know and why then, the bicycle was lying by the side of the road? No, I don't. Because it was too tired. Okay. Now I do remember the one now that you say it. Thank you for contributing, Dan. That's awesome. Uh, finally, if rubber comes from rubber trees and sugar comes from sugar canes, where does chicken come from? Poultries. Okay, okay. All right. Those are my dad jokes of the week. All right. Dan, what are your picks? Uh, okay, let's see. So um, my pick for this week is the fact that uh, another first for me, uh, it, well, contributing to open source wasn't the first, but it was after a long time. But this was actually a real first. Uh, I participated in a uh, um, uh, Twitter space. Uh, well, actually, I've participated before, but this time I was actually like the speaker on the Twitter space. I was invited to speak on the JavaScript Jam um, uh, space. It's a, it's a really good one. They have this whole series of spaces where they in, in, invite you know, people in the JavaScript community to talk about uh, stuff. And uh, they brought me over to talk about, uh, uh, you know, frameworks and performance, which is not surprising because, you know, hey, I talk about this, uh, this stuff a lot. Um, and it was really a lot of fun because we had uh, as like uh, surprise guests on, on this uh, space. We also had uh, Mishko and we had uh, Theo. So we had, uh, you know, really interesting conversations about this stuff. Um, it should be available as a recording on the JavaScript Jam uh, website by the time this podcast comes out. Um, I have to say like, that I really enjoyed the experience of participating in the Twitter space, but the actual interface or, or usage of, of Twitter spaces is pretty horrendous. Uh, I don't know. I've heard that. I don't know if you've ever actually tried it. It's, it's pretty terrible. You know, just the fact that you have to use your phone if you want to be able to, you know, record what you say, to speak in, not just listen. Uh, that seems incredible to me. Um, also, you know, when I try to play back, it gets stuck all the time. It's, it's pretty terrible. The API is, is the UI is, is like total shit. That's all I can say. But the actual experience of participating in one was, was great and I really enjoyed it. So that would be my, my pick. And my second pick, well, is the same pick that I pick each and every time. It's the ongoing war in Ukraine, which is still ongoing uh, and likely to get worse once, we, as, you know, as we're moving into summer. Uh, and, you know, uh, the Russians throw much more uh, soldiers and, and, and firepower into this conflict. It's, it's likely to get a whole lot worse. So, yeah, whatever our listeners can do for the people of Ukraine, I urge them to do it. And th those are my picks for today. Awesome. All right. Um, AJ, what are your picks? Well, I've got some goodies for you. So first, uh, earlier I mentioned callbacks. This is not a presentation I gave. This was a presentation that I was uh, co-hosting. But Travis Barney gives a talk on a specification that I think comes from the RxJS guys. I'm not. It comes some some library that has to do with some sort of signaling or whatever you want to call it. And it it's really interesting. It's 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 basically a specification that is similar to promises but oriented around events, composable events, rather than, than single instances. So with a, with a promise, the event happens one and you're done. So you wouldn't use a promise for something like on click because on click is going to happen multiple times and you want, you, you know, you use callbacks for that. And with call bags, like bag, like a shopping bag, call bags, the idea is that you you just in the same way that promises make callbacks composable callbacks make events composable uh, multi recurring events composable and so once i understood that it was as, as it at its core 
it's something that's very simple that you could put on a, a slide that's, you know, 15 lines long or so, just like you can with a promise. You can do a full promise implementation in about 15 lines. And callbags is, is similar, but it works for events. And I thought, I thought it's really cool. I think it's a pattern that you can at least learn from. And it's not a library. It's not a framework in the same way that promises are not a library or a framework. There are libraries that implement promises, but you know, if you just put a dot then method on something, if it doesn't fail, then you've got a promise and, and callbacks are, are similar. Uh, I also, there's there, I was trying to find the tweet where I said, apparently what Douglas Crockford said, I, I probably heard it from him and then forgot that that's where it came from. But uh, while well, I was looking for that, I, a, a while ago, last time we talked about monads with somebody, I afterwards <laughs> had posted a uh, a link to or, or a screenshot of Wikipedia where it says this article is too technical for most readers, and so I just thought it was kind of funny because no one on planet Earth has been able to explain monads in a in a way that Wikipedia can accept it without a flag. Then I also I'm going to pick three books the lost metal it's the last book of mistborn era 2 uh, it has it it's it's got a a satisfying ending it really things are starting to feel like avengers in the cosmere you know you remember the marvel movies where every movie has an epilogue that then ties into another movie and then characters from the different uh systems within the universe start to come together that the lost metal has got that going on and so it's really interesting to see the Avengers style uh, crossover, you know, the comic book style crossover happening in a book series where each book is, you know, between 500 and 1500 pages. But Brandon Sanderson is doing it well. So we just, my wife and I, well, we actually, we haven't finished the epilogue yet, but we finished the main story. The epilogue goes on for about an hour. So we, we've got, uh, we, we finished that and I thought that was good. I also just finished the knife of never letting go. That's the one that I've been using to fall asleep at night. And then I'll rewind it the next night. And I've been doing that for a month or two. And so I finally 30 minutes at a time, I've gotten through the whole book. And this is, there was a movie called chaos walking and it got really bad reviews. And I watched a review on it that said, uh, that basically if they had followed the book, it could have been great. And that piqued my interest because the premise that the movie showed in the trailer was interesting, which is based, well, I won't go into it. You'll have to look it up because it's difficult to explain. But uh, anyway, and and so I, the first book, The Knife of Never Letting Go, did not disappoint. It was very satisfied with it. Uh, I guess it's too bad that the movie didn't follow the book. And then the last thing is The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes is the prequel to The Hunger Games and President Snow is an extremely likable character. So I'm only a few chapters in, but I'm very interested to see where this go be goes because I'm on Team Snow right now. <laughs> Which, who who could have thought that? You know, if you're familiar with Hunger Games, he's the bad guy. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, I'm rereading the uh, Brandon Sanderson series uh, heading into the Lost Metal. So I'm on uh, Shadows of Self, which is the second in those. Anyway, Ian, what are your picks? Uh, yeah, the Lambda cast, as I said before, 23 episodes, uh, really easy to listen to. It's not a boring topic, even though it probably sounds like it should be. Uh, and then uh, the other one I, I picked this last time, I'm going to pick it again, is uh, is uh, CPAP machines. If uh, anybody out there, if you feel groggy during the day, tired, you snore, you wake up to pee at night, you know, they say 90% of cases are undiagnosed and uh, uh, sleep apnea is an epidemic, epidemic and uh, it's pretty hard to imagine once you get used to not sleeping that way that you ever lived that way before. So uh, I'm just going to pick that again. Get yeah, my dad, my dad has one. He had issues where he was so tired that he would be at client meetings and literally falling asleep <laughs> because he yeah, believe it. didn't get any sleep. And once he got diagnosed and got a CPAP, he up like a log and hasn't had that hasn't had that problem since then well there you go cool uh i'm gonna throw in my picks real quick i always pick a board game uh this one i'm gonna pick it's called the quacks of quedlinburg and you're basically making a potion trying to make sure it doesn't blow up and um the way it blows up is if you get too many white ingredients all the ingredients have colors 
um, then it'll blow up. And so, you know, the other ones have different effects. The, the further you get on your potion, the more points you get, the more money you get to spend. Um, Board Game Geek ranks it at, um, I think it was a 1.99. I'm trying to look it up, but I spelled it wrong. Um, oh, here we go. It is 1.95. So it's, it's easy to pick up casual gamer, lots of pieces, but it's a fun game. So I'm going to pick that. And then, um, our book club this month, we're reading, uh, pragmatic programmer by Dave Thomas and Andy hunt. And everybody's been enjoying it. So I'm going to pick that, uh, next month. We're actually doing a non code book but it's very much in line with uh, leveling yourself up on a regular basis. We're going to read the compound effect by Darren Hardy, and then we're going to get back into code books. So uh, keep an eye out for that. I think we might do seven languages in seven weeks and we'll see if I can get Bruce to show up. Um, But yeah, uh, anyway, good stuff. I read uh, compound effect and I just loved it. And I thought this is a book that everybody needs to read. So we're doing it for the book club. Um, but yeah, I'm going to pick that. And then um, we're moving all of our calendaring and automation and everything else to a new system called Pipeline Pro. Um, and you can get a lifetime license for not terribly expensive. I did pick up some of the add-ons because it gave me some of the features that I want. Um, but I'm really liking it. So I'm going to pick Pipeline Pro as well. And with that, I think we're done. So we'll go ahead and wrap up. And until next time, folks, Max out.